I guess a lot of people here will work in a team. I mean, just a quick show of hands if you spend a lot of your time working as part of a team. So kind of almost everyone puts their hand up. But I suppose, for me, that's the fascinating thing. We all work as a part of a team. We would mostly say that teams are essential. The work that the RSA fellows do, solving some of the most complex challenges in the world, require collective action. So we know teams are everywhere. We also know that they're fundamental. And yet the gap between working in a team and a team that works well seems to grow ever larger. The starting point of great teams is great individuals. And there's probably been no greater individual, certainly in the world of business, in our generation than Steve Jobs. Great individuals are the building blocks of great teams. Uh, he was famed for his leadership style, something uh, I think Isaacson called management by character assassination. He would regularly berate his team members with the term bozo, and if you forgive his Californian vocabulary, shitheads who suck. The truth is, is that he fell out with everyone that he worked with. He fell out with Steve Wozniak, who he founded the company with. He'd recruited John Scully from Pepsi with the challenge, you know, you can sell sugared water for the rest of your life, or you can come and change the world. But he fell out with John Scully, the CEO who he'd recruited. And in 85, he famously found himself forced out from the company he had founded. Despite his vision, despite his obsession with user experience and the elegance of simplicity, he was on his own, unable to execute. So being fired from the company you founded probably is one of the most painful experiences you can have. It taught him the lesson of leadership the hard way. It taught him that teams may be necessary to achieve greatness. Being inspired by Pixar, the team and company he founded after he left Apple, was equally as powerful a lesson for him. He bought Pixar as the graphics division from LucasArts. Jobs bought three people, effectively. John Lasseter, Ed Catmull, and a guy called Alvy Ray Smith. And Jobs bought that company with a view, in many respects similar to the view he'd had at Apple, that the hardware and software that Pixar was creating would one day democratize technology, that it would be tools for geniuses. But actually, the team's vision was different. They wanted to inherit Disney's legacy for the digi digital age. They wanted to make movies, computer-generated animation. And it took one movie in particular to really shape and refocus Steve Jobs' reality distortion field. It was a film called Luxo Jr., and these films were only made to advertise the software and hardware that Jobs had invested in. But Luxo Jr. is an incredible story. It's a story about two standard lamps, a father and a son. And in watching it, the light went on, not only on the screen, but also in Jobs' mind. He had understood that the future of the firm lay in that movie business. They've done 12 movies, no flops, which is incredible in a hit-related business, and won 26, 27 Oscars. But the beginning came from Jobs' realization and admission that he was wrong. Imagine that. The most unreasonable man on the planet admitting that he was wrong. But more powerfully even than that, he admitted that the team was right. What Jobs had discovered was that the myth of the sole hero is just that. It's a myth. If you want to achieve greatness, if you want to accomplish the unreasonable, then perhaps you need collective action. Individuals matter. Certainly, but they need to be amplified and organized through a team. I guess one of the principal challenges of teamwork, though, is when you combine very unreasonable people together. The Rolling Stones, uh, at this point, I think, have played to more people in more places than any other band in the world. Their success, in many respects, comes from the similarities, but perhaps even more so, the differences between them. Jagger is famously the lead singer, but he also loves taking the lead off the stage as well. He's the CEO of the band. It was him that brought in the banker, Prince Rupert Lowenstein, who re-engineered their business model. I think the last three tours of the Stones have generated in the region of $1.6, $1.7 billion. On the other hand, you've got someone like Keith, who doesn't plan, who famously says he's happy just to wake up in the morning, and focuses a lot of his time now on the pleasure of breathing. Mick writes a song with an endpoint in mind. Keith doesn't live his life with any point in mind. He just lives it. He's much looser. In his own words, Mick is rock and he is roll. They're very different. But it's that difference that creates the magic. 
The magic is in the mix. It's the creative abrasion between those two conflicting personalities that actually generates a lot of the energy that the stones have. But the seeds of that creativity are also the ingredients that can split the band apart. You know, most bands last maybe one album. Some bands only last one hit. But this is a group that played at the highest level of performance for 50 years. So what is it that keeps them together, despite the fact they have sparks that fly very often? And one of the starting points, I suppose, is the other band members. Ronnie Wood, the new boy, despite having been there for a, an exceedingly long time, uh, is very different again from the other two. He's the harmonizer. He's the mediator. Often with the instincts of a veteran peace negotiator, he's the one that's got the two back together and talking. Charlie Watts is different again. He is steady, stoical. He's the only one of the Stones who stayed with the same partner for the whole of his life, the whole of his career, a woman he met before they were famous. When the others are out doing their tours in rock and roll shenanigans, Charlie draws every single hotel room he has stayed in. Quite a different character. The backbeat, the, so the solid and the steady. And that combination, again, helps diffuse some of the drama between Keith and Mick. And cohesion initially comes from spending time together. The band, in their early days, spent all of their time together. They lived together. They shared the back of their van with their instruments on tour. They even shared a few girlfriends. But today, the reason that they have cohesion, after all those years of familiarity, perhaps breeding contempt, is the space they spend apart. The team now only forms when it has to, only when there is a true purpose for it being together, and that purpose is either writing or touring. Otherwise, they retreat to their Caribbean hideaways or their French chateau. So the team only comes together when it has to. The final reason I think the Stones have stayed together, and it's a powerful one that I'll come on to a bit more, is the notion of common purpose. This is a group that has a declared intention a compelling motivation to be the greatest rock and roll band in the world. In the 80s, when Mick tried to go solo, for me, I think it offered him a visceral reminder that to achieve his own personal ambitions, fame, celebrity, stardom, playing to the biggest audiences in the world, was only achievable through the Stones. Teamwork often works only because for the individual, the alternative is worse. It has to offer its members the best means of achieving their own ambitions. And talking of compelling purpose, in some respects, there's no purpose that I found more compelling than that of the Red Cross. Saving lives, changing minds. When the Haiti earthquake struck in 2010, it killed 200,000 people. It injured a further 300,000 and made homeless over 1.5 million. Haiti is one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. And when that earthquake struck, and it struck in its urban center of Port-au-Prince, its effect was devastating, absolute carnage. So you had the Haitians on the ground, on the front line, responding immediately to the distress of their peers. You equally had people flying in from all over the world. 50 different uh, Red Cross national societies uh, went to the rescue. But it was actually a, a little old lady in Wimbledon, Wimbledon High Street at a Red Cross shop, who for me gave me the most profound insight as to the power of purpose for a team. When I asked her what she did and why she did it, she said very simply, each item of clothing that I collect, each item of clothing that I sell, no matter how big or small, actually is saving lives. She saw herself as part of something bigger than she was. She saw herself contributing to something that had purpose and meaning. And great teams are motivated by a compelling and common purpose. It's like a North Star around which everyone can navigate to. It stops the situation where when you shout go, everyone running in different directions. It convenes you, it aligns you, and it pulls you forward in the same direction. Perhaps um, in addition to common purpose, in addition to the cohesion of teams, one of the most practical and interesting insights that I discovered in all of the teams I looked at is the idea that actually no one and no team can get better without practice. A Formula One team, and this is uh, the Ferrari team uh, with Michael Schumacher uh, from about 1998, 99, I think it might be. Um, a team like this of 20 mechanics will practice a pit stop probably 2,000 times a season. What's interesting is the science and rigor 
around which they designed and choreographed that interplay between the different parties. It's something that they applied successfully in Formula One, but actually, more remarkably, they also took to Great Ormond Street Hospital. Working alongside the cardiac intensive care unit, they re-engineered the handover process post-operations using the same principles of rigorous design, of defining together what's the best way of us collaborating, and then practicing it over and over and over again. It turns out that team excellence is a learned habit. The protocols of performance that generate enormous and incredible success with some of the teams I've looked at are not things that happen by chance. They happen by design and by deliberate practice. One of the most powerful of those, and I return to Pixar, uh, it's called the Brain Trust. It's a protocol that I really like because it merges both the individual input but also the collective output. One of the things they do for every movie is the director and the producer convene a group of eight of the best people at Pixar. And what they do is have an incredibly brutal and honest discussion in order to create the best movie possible. But it's the rules of engagement of that meeting that make it work. The director and producer do not have to take or accept, they can ignore completely any single one of the notes and comments and pieces of advice that the others give them. And why is that powerful? That's powerful because it means they can let go of their defensiveness. They can open their arms and hear these ideas for what they are. It also liberates the other people in the team to be honest, to say what they think, to not to be too sensitive, but to let the needs of the movie dictate their comments. What they've achieved is a democracy of ideas and a dictatorship of decisions. It avoids a movie being made by committee, but it also avoids the tyranny of the individual. You can't have a great team without great individuals. That's inescapably true. The problem is most great individuals are also the most unreasonable. So you have to figure out of helping them cohabit, to help them figure out how to help them collaborate. Teams need to work on building cohesion, on mastering conflict, so that the creative abrasion ensures the sparks fly, but don't burn the whole house down. Great teams need to have a common purpose. They need to have a singular idea, a navigatable North Star, that connects in a line of sight individual motivations to collective action. The team has got to be the best way for me to achieve my personal ambitions. Great teams don't happen by accident. They happen by design and by deliberate practice. So if we really want to address some of the most complex and challenging problems that society faces, if we want to close the gap between today's reality and the hopes that people hold for a better world, perhaps the best place for us to start is by practicing with our own teams. Thank you very much.